thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to do for the next 30 odd minutes is to kind of look, about, look at mobile. I've spent the last 25 years really trying to think about what's coming next. And mobile has been very much what we've been doing for the last 10 years. And yet I get asked this question all the time, what's going to come next? So that's where we're going to go with this. I'm going to touch on a lot of themes that you're going to hear much more about during the day. Uh, and they're going to give a lot more detail about the technology. But really, I want to talk to you guys about um, where I think the world's going. What technology is going to impact on us. But you know, also things like, you know, are we still going to have a job at the end of this? So I'm going to go back to now. Um, I could start with lots of stats and data, but actually Jonathan set the scene perfectly with his stats and data. But I, I'm actually going to use one picture to sum up the current world of digital communications as I, as I understand it, and it's this. This was tweeted a couple of years ago um, with the pithy comment, and I will paraphrase this, uh, I wonder what this person is looking at the world. What it tells us is this, is that normality has become everybody on their phones. The odd one out is the guy who's actually looking around at the world. I know what many of you are thinking, his battery probably ran out at that point. Um, Funnily enough, my, my, uh, 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 my university boss actually sent me a similar picture he took on uh, uh, the station at uh, Stourbridge Station uh, yesterday morning. So clearly this is not a coincidence. You only have to look around you and it happens all the time. Um, I think, you know, when I started with, all of the, uh, uh, with mobile, and particularly around digital transformation, mobile was seen as very much an add-on. It was the thing you did. It was what the brief always had, and mobile at the bottom. And yet now, and I think that this, this quote sums it up brilliantly, this is from a really interesting analyst called uh, Benedict Evans, Anderson Horowitz, smartphones are the sun and everything else revolves around it. Smartphones have absolutely become the centre of our universe, and we are, we are checking them and, and we are arguably addicted to them. Um, how many times is that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get for a bit of audience participation now. We're going to see how many times you think people actually uh, open their mobile phones every day. So we're going to do this through standing up. It's early in the morning. Let's get you moving a bit. So everybody stand up. Well done. I like this cooperation. So if you think we look at our mobile phones 25 times a day or less, you can sit down. Interestingly. What about 50 times a day or less? Okay. 100 or less? Interesting. 150 or less? Okay. More than two, less than 200? Okay. So some of you think it's more than 200. Okay, you can sit down. Thank you very much. Um, Facebook looked at this a couple of years ago, and they said that we essentially get out our phones and open them to look at them 150 times a day. So most of you are round about that kind of median. Um, but I look at it, I think, is that all? And in fact, there was a study last year, and what they said is that we interact with our mobile devices two and a half thousand times a day. In other words, we get them out, we look at stuff, we tap on things. There's a whole variety of reasons for that, and that, of course, creates problems. One of the big problems in, 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 in any city, uh, as I walked to the station this morning, I turned back to look at everyone else heading to the station, and every single person was on their phone. And, of course, if you're a, a pedestrian going the opposite direction, if you're a cyclist, if you're a car driver, that creates a problem. Um, the, the, uh, the Dutch, being somewhat go ahead in this area, um, have actually designed a, a, a pedestrian walkway specifically for the mobile generation. That if you're looking down. Personally, I think that actually the future of, of this bit of mobile is probably uh, actually to put proximity sensors in your device so that the screen will flash red when you see that kind of oncoming, that impending cyclist that you haven't actually noticed. So how did we get here? Well, let's start with, with, with a bit of future thinking. One, one of the things about thinking about the future is that it's always very much thought about in the current technology of that age. This is from 1900, uh, and there was a whole series of, of these about what it would be like in the year 2000. It was done for the uh, World's Fair in Paris. Uh, and a lot of it was based around flying things. Uh, here is the flying postman. 
Um, and I guess, arguably, you know, if you believe Amazon's drone delivery, maybe we've kind of got that. And then they had lots of things underwater. But they didn't predict the phone This was because that was a digital technology, and that's really not what we were thinking about. By the time we get to the 1950s, it was very much about the jet age. Um, and I guess, you know, flying cars. And that was, that was the promise of the future, was flying cars. Now, all I have to do is to look around today and see that all the cars are actually firmly stuck on the ground. Uh, we haven't actually delivered on that promise. So what have we actually delivered on? So the future promise of flying cars, what do we get? The selfie. Um, but this is a really important point. No, it wasn't Hillary Clinton. We got the selfie, this bit. Um, and here's the point about this, is that this is about the unintended consequences of what we're doing with technology. When you put a high-quality camera into people's phones, and they have it with them all of the time, what they do is take, they take photos. We take one trillion photos every year. In three minutes, we take more photos than were actually uh, taken in the 19th century when photography was invented. And a lot of this is, I mean, the selfie is very interesting because to some extent we kind of see it as narcissism, but I think there's actually, I don't think it's quite as simple as that. So what happens is every time, and I'm sure you've all done this, you post a picture somewhere, let's say Instagram, uh, you go back, because of course we're checking two and a half thousand times a day, and you go back and you look at it and you go, well, have I got, have I got any likes yet? That's after five minutes, then after ten minutes, and so on. And each time you get a like, it kind of triggers a small endorphin. So it basically gives you a little hit of pleasure every time you see that. So actually, people's kind of obsession, about 15% of Instagram, by the way, is selfies. And probably, for all I know, 99% of Snapchat is selfies. But what it's doing there, it, 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 it's kind of driving that addiction. And this is why we're constantly getting our phones out and looking at it, is all of these kind of behaviors. The other thing that I think is a really important trend is uh, this, the emoji. Um, I do genuinely think that the emoji is a language that offers lots of kind of artistic creative potential. There's all kinds of things. But here's the thing about the emoji, is if you put a smiley face on the end of a text message, a message, um, you can, it changes the meaning. That, that, face, that smiley face taps into the brain in exactly the same way as looking at a real person. And you can think about how adding those things, uh, adding a smiley or, or whatever to uh, a message, actually can change the meaning. And as a result of that, what we've done is we're, we're actually texting fewer lols, fewer acronyms, and we've switched very much to using emojis. So less lols, more laughing, crying face. And what's important about this and it is, uh, it is, is the extent to which we've become, uh, through things like the camera and through things like this, we've become much more about visual communications and that actually pictures are becoming our main form of communication. Now, all of this is driven by one thing, which is the growth of computing power. It's quite hard to explain it, so this example is probably the best way to look at it. This is a um, <clears throat> Cray 2 supercomputer from 1985. Filled a room, cost $35 million. The power of that computer was beaten by the iPhone 4. So that's 2010. And for me, 2010 is very much our tipping point. Now, it's not just the iPhone 4, it was that generation, it was the Samsung Galaxy. All of them beat a Cray 2 supercomputer. And that kind of changed everything. Because once you have a supercomputer in your pocket, you can essentially access anything you want, anytime you want. One of the things that's happened is that we've kind of blurred the line between offline and online. If you think about it, uh, for those of you who remember dial-up modems, I have to say for those of you that remember, we've been, now been doing digital for so long, some of you might not even remember dial-up, but uh, going online was a distinct activity. You would have to open a computer, you'd have to dial-up, even when you had uh, the first... Um, uh, uh, broadband connections, you still had to do it as a, a distinct thing. Now we simply just get out our phones, and whatever we need to know, whatever information we want, wherever we want to go, we can just do that instantly. And we don't think about on and offline. Probably the only time is when we actually don't have a signal or we don't have Wi-Fi. But most of the time, that line has become completely blurred. My one chart of the day. This is, uh, this is really interesting, because this is Larry Down's Laws of Disruption. And it's based on, uh, well, there's Moore's Law. Many of you are probably familiar with Moore's Law, but just to give you a quick uh, 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 pricey of it, essentially, um, he observed, it wasn't actually a law, that computing power doubles every year and the price halves. Now, what that means is that is exponential. So your kind of curve is going like that. 
And as a result of that, technology hits us much faster than we expect. And as you get higher up that curve, uh, obviously that exponential happens. Now, as people, we, we can kind of adopt that a little bit. And what you'll see, and this is where the 2010 thing with the iPhone 4 started to create that gap between, for example, society and business, people and business. So what started to happen was things like the BYOD movement. So you're starting to see, before 2010, generally the most powerful computer you had was the one on your desk. And as an employee, your employer could control that. They could tell you what you could look at, you couldn't access Facebook. I even came across some places where you couldn't even access Google. But once you had that supercomputer in your pocket, you can do whatever you want. So people are beginning to dictate the interaction. If you think about uh, also uh, consumer level, it used to be that businesses said how that they would communicate with consumers. These days, it's almost flipped around as the consumers are telling the businesses how they want to communicate. They're like, well, wh why haven't you got a Facebook page? Why can't I moan at you on Twitter? And there is that expectation. And that's where we're adopting faster. That's where things like selfies, emojis, these are all driving it. So businesses always lag behind. And that's completely understandable. As businesses, you know, we have you know, structures. To, uh, we have to worry about things like profit, KPIs, all of those kinds of things. Government will always lag behind. And that's, again, because they are more bureaucratic than anyone else. Big bureaucracies, they have to do policy. Um, and I guess, you know, GDPR is a, is a good example of where governments are kind of trying to reverse legislate. Um, and society, consumers, are way ahead of that. Now, coming back to this sort of exponential growth, what it means is that, of course, potentially we can start putting computing in everything. So, Let's look at a few things that I think might impact on the future. I'm going to start with, uh, you know, this ability, uh, and this isn't just simply about um, computing power, it's also the ability to have things like sensors as well um, to create new forms of um, devices. Uh, so th this is wearables. This isn't a particularly new wearable. Uh, it is Chinese, like most of the products we get today, but this Chinese wearable is 300 years old. This is a abacus, and it's a ring, and it was aimed at traders, um, and it obviously allowed them to calculate their trades, their deals. Um, moving forward to the 1980s, we've always had this drive to have wearable stuff, so you get things like the Casio watches. But it's not until pretty much a couple of years ago that, that things like the sensor technologies, things like accelerometers, which would have cost a couple of hundred dollars initially, uh, you can now get for, uh, I've seen them online from China for about two dollars for an accelerometer. Um, and all these cheap items means that we can do this. Um, quick question. Um, so, uh, kind of big Christmas present, I think, for a couple of years ago was some form of fitness band. Uh, put your hands up, anyone who owns, I'm not saying wears, anyone who owns a fitness band somewhere. Okay. Uh, keep your hand up if you're still wearing it. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, there was a study that looked at it, and of course, what they found is that fitness bands, uh, about 50% of them just end up in a drawer. Um, I always say fitness bands are a bit like sandwich toasters. You know, everybody gets a sandwich toaster, you use it for a month, and then you stick it in a cupboard and never use it again. Um, and the same kind of thing is happening with that. And, and there's lots of reasons for it. And part of it is that something like this is, is quite temporary. Uh, an actual fact, if you just want to do something simple like measure your steps, you can do it through your mobile phone anyway. And increasingly what we're going to see is these devices, these kind of spin-off devices, will actually be brought into our core device, the mobile phone. The other thing to remember about any of these, uh, any technology itself, is that it's always highly contextual. And I'll give you an example from the world of wearables. Is, so it's never about the technology itself, it's about how it's being used. So here are two wearable devices. On the left we have an electronic tag. So the job of an electronic tag is essentially to keep people, particular sorts of people, in one place, namely their house. On the other side, we have the Disney Magic Band. Disney Magic Band, its job is to keep people in one place, namely Disney parks. Um, what's interesting about Disney Magic Band is that they made a choice. They made a choice as either we build a new park or we spend a billion dollars on making this thing. And 
It is brilliant. I don't know if anybody's been to a Disney Park and used these, but you get them before you arrive. Uh, you can use them on the bus. You can obviously book into your rides and you check in. And a nice bit of uh, user experience, the little Mickey Mouse um, silhouette, you just connect to any Mickey Mouse silhouette. And when you want to order some food, you simply go into the restaurant. You can order off the band. And because, of course, it's connected to your card, you can already pay for it and leave. And so what we're interested in, I guess, through wearables, is trying to connect, create these, these kind of seamless, these frictionless experiences um, that we're already beginning to see through our mobile devices. The other interesting point about this is that this is Disney parks. Disney parks are experiential. They're not, they don't build tech products. And increasingly, we're going to see this. So, so businesses, brands that are really quite service brands, will increasingly be getting involved in, in, in technology, just as tech brands we know have to provide a lot of service. So the lines between who is a tech brand and who, who isn't are going to be increasingly blurred. Um, this is uh, Levi's. Uh, they actually work with Google on this. This is Project Jacquard. And what they've done here is increasingly that the wearables, rather than being distinct devices, the technology is actually built in to the garment itself. So this is, uh, they call it their trucker's jacket, but essentially it's aimed at cyclists moving around town, trying to avoid the people on their mobile phones. Um, and the, the cuff there, that's the rechargeable bit of the device. But the actual sleeve is connected. Uh, it's a, a conductive technology, and you can use swipes on the sleeve to both do things like change music that you're listening to, and obviously things like directions. But I think with, with wearables, it's going to go beyond that as well. And I think the next thing is ultimately going to be, um, it's going to be these things. These are ingestibles um, that maybe will actually be, be eating our devices in future. This is a small pill that you take, and uh, as it travels through the body, it can pick up uh, various different um, symptoms, and it can communicate them back to a smartphone. Uh, one of the interesting things about all of these devices that I've shown you is that they still rely on a phone. So the phone, the mobile, is the core computing device. And essentially, these are satellite devices. And I think there's a strong argument to say that these are not replacements for the mobile phone. They're simply additions. And not only that, we're not all going to have the same additions. So we're going to choose. Some of us want fitness bands. Some of us might want something that's wearable, like, I don't know, glasses. Um, you're going to have a go on VR today, I believe, or some of you will. VR is another one of these interesting technologies. And certainly, more in the world of media, I'm kind of told, yes, everybody's going to be having VR. We're going to be wearing these, these glasses and stuff. Um, I don't know. Certainly, VR is something that we've been interested in for a while. This is, this is the 1960s. This is called the Sensorama. This was the first ever attempt at doing this. Um, and it kind of had everything. It had 3D, wide vision, motion, color. Um, one thing I absolutely love about this, uh, third from the bottom, aromas, smell. Now, why didn't Oculus Rift ever think of this? But it's a really good example about the growth of the technology, right? That, at that, in, in the 60s, the technology wasn't powerful enough to really deliver anything meaningful. By the time you get to the 90s, you get this. Uh, and this is the beginnings of, of what we understand as VR right now. And again, I think it suffered from a problem with the technology. Firstly, the cost. These were coming in, the good ones were coming in at the thousands. But the other issue was uh, latency was the lag. The technology wasn't fast enough to deliver a realistic experience. I remember going to Sega World, uh, they were a client of mine in those days, and going to Sega World and actually trying out one of these things and feeling distinctly queasy. And that whole kind of the vomit problem, as we call it, and it, it exists a little bit with today, but it, it's got much better. And if we sort of fast forward today, I mean, I think this is generally, the HTC Vive is generally regarded as one of the better ends of um, uh, VR. And the point here is that uh, the technology allows us to do this. So number one is, is essentially retina-type screens. So it's the screens, it's the computing power, it's the sensors, it's the accelerometers, all the tilt sensors that you can use within that. But for me, I always have a problem with VR because it kind of takes you away from the world. And that can be really good when you're doing things like games and driving. But I see brands essentially trying to replicate real-world experiences in VR. And I don't think we're necessarily going to be spending a lot of time doing this. I see a lot of niches for it. I see a lot of niches in science and medicine, and that's great, and it's a good tool. A lot of people are talking about the future as being one from mixed realities. This is uh, Magic Leap. 
This is possibly the most hyped company in the world. Every year they make a big announcement. They don't actually release anything, but they make a big announcement. And uh, earlier this year, they announced these things, which are essentially augmented reality glasses. Certainly from their videos, the experience looks really good. And I think this connection between the real world and the projected world is a very interesting one for the future. But are we all going to be walking around wearing glasses? Are we going to ditch our mobile devices for a pair of these? Uh, no. Uh, no, rule number one is that basically if, it, if the technology makes people look stupid, they're not going to adopt it. This is why we don't all travel around on segways as well. Um, same kind of thing. But I think the other problem is, is that, that it, it, even as augmented reality, it kind of takes you away from the world too much. One of the problems is actually lack of feeling. When I saw, I saw a, a, an earlier demo of the HTC Vive, and, and it allows you to move around an area, it sets an area, and the guy who was demoing it said, oh yeah, you'll have to stand back because last week I hit a client. And it kind of explains the problem is that it, it lacks what we call haptics, it lacks feeling. Now, there's some really interesting developments that are going on. Uh, there's various methods of trying to introduce haptics, but this one, which is ultrasound, I find particularly interesting. So ultrasound can create vibrations that give you the feeling. So you, you could actually create a boundary around a VR or a mixed reality experience. You can create the feeling of buttons. You can create the feeling of pushing. And not only that, and this is about future communications, is you can do it remotely. You can do essentially what, what is being termed telepresence. So certainly that um, uh, ultrasound is enough to move light objects, bits of cloth or paper. And you could potentially have some kind of virtual conference where you could hold your hand out and virtually shake the hand of the person that you're meeting. But again, I don't see this as a replacement for, all, for the mobile and everything that we're doing. I guess the thing that is, is the big technology that we're talking about now, and the one that you're going to hear a lot of today, is about automation and AI. Uh, Gartner, the uh, research firm, do a hype cycle, and right now, of course, it's right at the top of, of that. Um, and there's all kinds of threats. And on the other hand side of it, there's all kinds of people saying it's not going to happen. Um, there's a fam there is a famous quote from Henry Ford who said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Um, thing is, he never actually said that. Somebody made that up. But this quote is true. Um, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty of fad. That was the, the president of Michigan Savings Bank, who I'm sure was a very wise man, when Henry Ford asked him to invest in that company. And so very often we're not able to accurately predict how these technologies are going to go and how they're going to impact on our lives. For me, one of the big technologies that's going to impact is through self-driving cars. Let me put it this way. If I said to you, I'm going to invent a machine tomorrow and it's going to transform our lives, the only drawback is it's going to kill 1.3 million people every year. You're going to tell me I'm mad. So the idea that we can actually replace drivers, the things that kill the people, with robotics seems to me to be eminently sensible. I'm well aware of the irony of where I am standing, by the way, in Mercedes-Benz world. Um, but in a way, having people driving cars makes no sense. It's not just about death, it's about time. Americans spend enough time in traffic jams every year to build the equivalent of 27 pyramids. If you've got self-driving cars, they can move much closer. But it also thinks that it starts to change our business model as well, because actually, if you've got a self-driving car that can just get itself any way you need, why own a car that spends 80% you know, of its time sitting there doing nothing? And so therefore, car ownership kind of becomes um, somewhat pointless. And that's a good example where that form of robotics, that form of AI, will be able to replace many of the driving jobs. One of the interesting things about this here is where AI comes in, because uh, obviously people worry, you know, when I talk to people about uh, self-driving cars, they go, but, you know, I don't trust them. Remember, each new self-driving car, as, as a driver, you have to build your experience over decades. He said, knowing that I've got to renew my insurance next month. Um, improving to them I have decades of experience. With a self-driving car, that, those decades of experience, all that, that training that's going on right now is built into the car immediately. And that's the thing about AI. Once it, it, it can obtain that knowledge almost instantly, 
and it can be as clever as anyone else. Um, so do I think, I often say to uh, uh, my students who are 18 year olds, I say, your children will never need to learn to drive. They'll never learn to drive. Where does that leave Mercedes-Benz world? Well, actually, I think what will happen with driving is it will become like horse riding. We used to ride horses as our major means of transport. The Victorians moaned about how dirty and loud horses were, uh, and obviously that's been replaced by the car. Now, driving will become a pastime, a leisure pastime. Some people will learn to drive, they will come to places like this, and they will be able to do a driving experience. But fundamentally, when it comes to transport, just moving around on our roads, getting from A to B, it will be done mostly by these things. Of course, the other promise of the future was, was robots, the, these kind of sentient human robots. So I'm going to show you some robots, uh, and here they are. I'll talk over this, but they're making pancakes. I've, I've shortened the video. The video itself is, well, however long it takes to make pancakes. Um, so here, the robot on your right is actually, uh, he was actually doing the cutlery. This one, here he goes, he's flipping the pancake. Underneath, whilst he flips that, I'll have a drink of water. Hurrah! Oh look, they applaud. And then the other one over there is setting the table. Now, as this video carries on, that doesn't strike me as particularly great. A toddler could basically do that. What's interesting about this is not necessarily the dexterity of the robots, but it's the fact that they learned to do that. Nobody programmed that into the robots. They were given a bunch of WikiHow videos on how to make a pancake, and they worked out how to do that. And being a video aimed at humans, it missed out some steps that perhaps a robot you would think could not understand. So it didn't explain that you had to actually go to the fridge and get the pancake batter out of the fridge. And the robots were able to connect that. And I think one of the most interesting things about artificial intelligence is its ability to connect the dots. And that's the difference between AI and just simply machines. Now, robots are getting a little bit more agile. I'm just going to show you uh, an example from last year from Boston Dynamics, who were Google-owned briefly. Uh, I believe they've been sold now. But anyway, here's a robot doing some somersaults. And, and showing off. Um, don't you just hate it when it shows off. But here's the point about this, is that you can sort of connect that with the uh, cognitive abilities of artificial intelligence. And you can start doing some really quite high-level jobs. This is, a, this is an example of a robotic pharmacist. So pharmacists, people that have to do a lot of training, and they have to continue their training. It's a highly uh, skilled, professional job. And yet, using AI, it can actually do a lot of that. And then you add in the, the, the kind of core abilities of robot, robotics, basically putting the right pills and the right uh, um, pillboxes, um, and you get a robotic pharmacist. And the thinking is that probably within about five years, these things will become a commonplace, possibly even replacing the job of a pharmacist. One of the things is, is we're actually using AI all the time. Every time you open your phone, and search on Google, you are accessing AI. And one of these. You're going to hear more about this stuff today. But increasingly, as I put it, voice is becoming the new normal. Latest figures from Amazon say about 20 million of these have been sold. And obviously, you compare that to the figures you heard at the start from Jonathan about mobile devices, and that is just a drop in the ocean. But let's just see how many people here have an Alexa. Cool. What kind of things do we use it for? You can shout out. Who uses it as a timer? Yeah, music, jokes. Only a few. Sorry? News. News, it's a good one. Painting, uh, yeah, I've used it for, uh, as a dictionary, for synonyms. Alexa, give me a synonym for whatever. Uh, it was interesting, actually, they, they did a little study of um, how people are using Alexa. And the top ranked one was the first one we did, which was the timer. So I do argue that an Alexa is really just a fancy egg timer. Um, that's slightly flippant, because what I think is really interesting about this is that we are beginning to talk to machines. 
You may recall many years ago, they used to have automated cinema announcements, and you had to say the film you want. It was just the most frustrating experience ever. And obviously, being a bit British about this, you didn't really want to feel you were talking to a machine. Um, but I think what Alexa's doing, uh, and all of the other devices, uh, but this is, Alexa, by the way, is by far the lead, uh, is what they're doing is they're really getting us used to the idea of actually being able to communicate with a machine and communicate through AI. And as we do that, we'll start to see that integrated into everything we do. This is what Google thinks might be the future around voice. Hey, Google. Book a table for two at El Cocotero on Tuesday at 7. All right. Just in case that's not available, can I try between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m.? Sure. All right, I'll call to book under your name and phone number, and I'll update you in the next 15 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect, thanks. El Cocotero, how may I help you? Hi, I'm the Google Assistant, calling to make a reservation for a client. Um, this automated call will be recorded. Can I book a table for Tuesday the 12th? Okay, cool. And how big is the party? It's for two people. Great. And when did you say they want to come in? Um, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, let me check. Mm-hmm. I don't have 7, but we can do 8. Yeah, 8 p.m. is fine. Perfect. And can I get their name? The uh, first name is Anna. Okay. We'll see Anna Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. Anna for two. Right this way. There's such a Google video, it makes me smile because they've got all these very nice, shiny, perfect people doing all these kind of hipsterish things and going to these uh, uh, kind of nice uh, uh, Spanish restaurants. Um, I mean, that's kind of Google's ambition, and what's really interesting is that's very much coming from the consumer side of it, things. Uh, but potentially it could work the other way. Now, it is interesting, but I think the important thing, and you may have seen the Google Duplex demo at their um, conference where they, they basically uh, showed a recording from booking a hair, hair appointment and booking a, a restaurant as well. These are like the concept cars of the automotive world. Whether this is actually going to come into real usage, I don't know. I think what they're demonstrating is what the potential can be. And really, there's just a bit of a trick there, because actually when you look at what that voice assistant's doing, the thing that's making it give a sense of humanness is just really the way adding the ers into the speech. Um, and the way it says it is they've just put in a few little kind of human frailties to give us this sense that it's actually more like a person. But in reality, it's actually delivering a fairly simple message. Uh, I think the real ability there is to be able to recognize is that cognition, that ability to decide things. And increasingly, this is what we're going to see. There's generally a principle with AI which says this. If you can teach it to a person, if a person can learn this thing, even if it's quite cognitive, then you can teach it to AI. Which then leads to the question, I do love a bit of Google predictive text. This is my Google predictive from the other day. Robots are trained by coming, taking over, taking our jobs. And this is the question. Robots are cute. Well, I guess whatever floats your boat, I say. Um, what's going to happen? Are robots going to take our jobs? Well, I think there are some jobs that are absolutely safe. My, my top list of jobs, um, that, yeah, impact on, on certain areas, you know, things like legal profession, accountancy, in fact, everything we do potentially can be impacted by AR, AI, and yet there's some jobs that will still always remain. Uh, top of my list are hairdressers. Again, back to 1900 when they thought uh, we would work robotic hairdressers. There will be a significant number of people who will always want their hair cut by a human. Put up your hand if you would, do not want your hair cut by a robot. Pretty good. Interestingly, normally it divides roughly between men and women, or the men with the least hair and women. But you just think about what it is about hairdressing. And it isn't simply about trust whether they'll do a good job or not, because theoretically a robot could actually do a better job than a human could do the perfect haircut every time. It's about the human interaction. What happens when you go to the hairdressers and you talk about your holidays and, you know, and, and it's the physical action of having, washing your hair. So here's my point is that actually 
Think about the humanness of what you do. So don't try and think about, oh, well, the robots can't do this because they're not clever enough. They will be clever enough. It's not about that kind of ability. It's about the human part of what you do. And you can think about all kinds of jobs, from physiotherapy to care jobs, but even something like the legal profession, there's a distinct humanness which is part of that. And whilst robots can do all of the case law and kind of find out, do the legwork, they can help you work smarter. But if ultimately, it's about where the humans lie. Now, of course, this leads us on to an obvious conclusion about what we, what's coming next, which is inevitably the cyborgs. This is a guy called Neil Harbison. Uh, he's an English guy who I've met. He, he works in the States. He, ha he lays claim to being the first uh, officially registered cyborg uh, because we've been putting technology implants into humans for, for decades. He is colorblind, so he has this detachable thing, and it actually uh, connects to, um, uh, it's actually d directly connected into his brain, and, and, and it sends sensors of colors, which allows him to see uh, colors again, uh, to no longer be colorblind. Now that's a one-off, but increasingly we are actually seeing consumer cyborgs. This is from a, a guy that I know, actually, Livio, um, and he's come up with this implant. It's called NorthSense, and it basically vibrates when you sense north, and you can buy it. The first run of 300 sold out in a couple of days, and it wasn't just the really kind of weird cyborg outliers and sci-fi fans. Uh, he was saying they were getting yet again lawyers coming and doing that. Now you wonder what on earth is the point of having uh, uh, something that vibrates when it's north. And he was basically saying the idea is it's about another sense. It's about creating uh, a different way of seeing the world. It isn't simply about directions. But for me, it's showing the possibility of actually, you know, this stuff could be implanted in us. We could, in fact, be doing a lot of things that we do on our mobile, maybe as cyborgs. It's a quote from uh, William Gibson. The future has already arrived, it's just not evenly distributed. And here's the thing is that all of this stuff is here. All of the abilities of AI are beginning to be discovered, and most of it could actually happen. It's just not, we're not seeing it all of the time. Now, there are some who kind of say, well, you know, perhaps the only way that we can deal with this onslaught of the robots is to become part of them ourselves, and that actually we should all become cyborg. Elon Musk said, said this, but a number of people are saying, actually, the only way that we can combine with them is all of this. So perhaps, you know, and for me, I, I genuinely think that actually the mobile phone is still going to remain our core computing device in whatever format. It might be bigger, brighter, it might be bendier. I'm very much looking forward to flexible screens. But the point is, is that um, it will be the core device until that becomes part of us. And imagine what is now your mobile phone when you need to access Google search, you'll be able to just think it and you can find out that information. Um, for some people, for many people, the thought of becoming a cyborg is a little bit scary. But think of it this way, think back to our stand-up thing at the start, and actually, we're never more than an arm's length away from our phone and we're accessing it two and a half thousand times a day. So just perhaps, We've already become cyborgs by proxy. They're just not built into us yet. Let me leave you with this final thought. And I was thinking very much about today, and you're going to hear a lot about the technologies that you hear today. And that's great. And these are really important things to understand. But ultimately, what Britannic do, why you're all here, is it's about communication. And fundamentally, communication is about people. And I don't think robots are ever going to replace people. Thank you very much.